Hi everyone and welcome to the Planetary Society's Weekly Hangout. I'm Emily Lakdawalla. I'm the blogger for the Planetary Society. I write every day about space science. At, oh my goodness, I just, I'm, uh, sorry about that. I blog every day at Planetary Society, uh, planetary.org slash blog about uh, active space missions and what's going on in space research and exploration. Uh, this week I am being joined by Jim Bell, who is the, he wears many hats actually at the Planetary Society. He's our esteemed president of our board of directors. And more importantly for today, he is the head cameraman on the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, as well as a member of the Curiosity Science team. Um, Jim, if you can bring your camera back on, then uh, we can all see you. My camera is on. Can you uh -oh. hear me? I can hear you just fine. I can't see you very well right hmm. now. There's a... let, me, let me toggle my camera. How's that? Did that help? Nope. Oh dear. <laughs> you should be able to, you can see your, your own head icon down there while you're trying to troubleshoot that. I can see myself just fine. Emily. You may need to drop out and drop back in. I'll give an introduction while you try doing that um, okay. about what's been going on on Mars recently. All right. Okay. So today is actually a very important day in Mars history. Today is the ninth anniversary of the landing of the Spirit rover on Mars. I was actually in mission control and that happened nine years ago. Um, it was really a very exciting day. It was the first successful landing in uh, a long time since um, the Pathfinder and Sojourner. And we saw this amazing rocky landscape and some distant hills that Spirit eventually climbed. And Jim Bell was there all along the way. Spirit is, of course, now no longer with us, but her sister Opportunity is exploring the rim of Endeavor Crater, getting started on um, a really exciting mission to explore that, that crater's rim and actually becoming, I think, the first rover to taste and touch some clay minerals on Mars, beating the Curiosity team to it. Uh, but in Jim's case, um, you're on both teams, so it really doesn't matter. You're, you win either way. And Curiosity has been uh, a little bit quiet as of the last few weeks, just exploring the terrain, um, uh, trying to find a good location for her first drilling activity, which is the last major activity she has to do before she finally gets started with the science mission and gets rolling toward that mountain in the middle of Gale Crater that should answer lots of our questions about the past history of Mars climate and whether life could ever have lived there. Um, so we've got a really exciting year ahead of us uh, in both Mars exploration and elsewhere. But before we get into talking about what's going on on Mars, I wanted to talk with Casey Dreyer here, who's uh, um, head of advocacy and outreach for the Planetary Society, about the things that we have to do to make sure that this kind of exploration can keep going. So Casey, can you fill us in on what's going on there? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you, Jim, for joining us today. Uh, so as a lot of you may know, and some of you may not, the Planetary Science Division within NASA has been facing a lot of fiscal uh, budgetary problems in the last year. The, uh, um, the uh, overall budget for planetary science has decreased by 20 percent and that prevents further missions like uh, Curiosity or Outer Planets missioning, missions from happening. So we here at the Planetary Society have been working on, at this point, a year-long campaign to try to reverse these proposed budget cuts, to try to uh, restore funding to a certain level that allows NASA to properly explore uh, the planets, and it's actually quite a small amount of money. So we're hoping that we can get everyone's help on this. A big issue that just happened a few days ago that a lot of you may be familiar with is something called the sequester and the fiscal cliff. So the Congress passed a deal on the fiscal cliff just a few days ago, extended tax cuts for people making less than 450000 a year, and it also did uh, what was called a delay of the sequestration. So as part of the uh, budget issues in 2011, Congress agreed to implement $1.2 trillion in cuts to all uh, parts of the government whether or not Congress figures out how to cut that money. So they have a sequestration, which is across the board automatic cuts, or Congress can find an alternative way to save the same amount of money over the next 10 years. Congress so far has not been able to find a way to save that money. And therefore, this thing called sequestration will come along and just slash every little piece of the government by about 8.5%. This is pretty rough news for planetary science. Planetary science is already losing 20% just from the proposed budget cuts in 2013. This would cut another 8% and just kind of slash it down even further. So the big news, again, from two days ago, is that sequestration delayed, was delayed by two months. So it's not an immediate threat to planetary science, but it's still hanging out there, and it's actually just a threat to all science research, and the entirety of NASA itself stands to face 
um, faces a cut of about 8%. So we're still holding our breaths on this one, still being involved, still going to DC and advocating our position with our uh, strategists there, and we'll just continue to keep everyone informed. So if again, if anyone wants to keep following this, you can go to planetary.org slash SOS, which stands for Save Our Science. It's our big advocacy campaign, and, and you can help out, write a letter to the president, and uh, keep following us for the latest news. Emily, you seem to be muted. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, it's, uh, before we get started with Jim, I would like to tell people about how you can ask questions later on in the broadcast. We'll take your questions. You can do that either by commenting in YouTube, commenting in Google Plus on this Hangout, or you can use Twitter using the hashtag PlanetaryLive. So any one of those three methods will get your questions in. Um, we'll we'll uh, select a few of them and, and hand them to Jim. So, Jim, you're bringing up, I think, some spiffy images on the two screens that you have behind you. I, I must say that I have always lusted after the screens that you guys on the <laughs> rover teams have to look at all of your pretty pictures with. Yeah. So um, can you start just by giving us an update? What have you been doing on Mars recently? Oh my gosh, well things are going just incredibly well uh, on Mars. Uh, as you know, we're back to having two rovers operating uh, simultaneously, or not quite simultaneously, at about 12 hours apart. Uh, on the planet. Uh, Opportunity is still going great in uh, Meridiani. Uh, Sol 3180 of our 90 Sol mission. Uh, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, it's uh, uh, tomorrow's the ninth anniversary of the Spirit landing, and in three weeks it'll be the ninth anniversary of Opportunity's landing, and then we will be starting our tenth year of continuous operation of uh, Opportunity on Mars. So that's just, uh, just pretty phenomenal. Um, and on the other side of the planet, Curiosity uh, is doing really well. Uh, Sol 147 of our 689 Sol mission, at least. Um, and uh, there, as you mentioned in the beginning, uh, starting off uh, relatively slowly. Uh, I like to say that the science team doesn't really have the keys to the vehicle yet. Uh, our engineering friends are spending a lot of time checking out each system and subsystem and making sure that uh, that everything's working properly for these first few months of the mission. And it's a slow process because lots of times we have to do this ground in the loop, you know, is the voltage correct, is the arm positioned properly, wait a day for the answer to come back from the earth, yes or no. Um, <clears throat> but there's really only, I think, two subsystems left for the engineers to do their initial checkouts on. One is the brush, uh, you know, we see a lot of these dusty rocks and we want to be able to brush off the dust, and so that's going to happen relatively soon. And then the last one, the big one, is the drill. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're starting to embark upon a campaign to identify a drill target uh, and do that first initial testing of the drill and get that, that powder into the instruments inside the rover. So once those systems get checked out, uh, and, and we're doing science during all these checkouts, you've seen some great press releases and all kinds of spectacular pictures and other data sets. Uh, once those systems get checked out, then, then I think the engineers will give us the keys and say, go, have a good time, go play. Uh, and we'll, we'll turn around and we'll head towards, uh, towards Mount Sharp, which is the, the, the real destination where we want to be. And that'll be a long drive, uh, but uh, we're, we're confident we'll be able to get there and start doing some even more exciting science with Curiosity. So, so things are going great on both sides of the planet. If you want to talk in more detail about some of this, we can do that, but that's kind of the high-level overview. I'm actually kind of wondering, since you're participating on both missions, um, I, can you talk about what's different about the way the two missions are operated? I know that with uh, Spirit and Opportunity, there was like one, originally in the mission, there was one huge room that was divided into like these little disciplinary um, little sections where people would discuss what they wanted to do for geology and meteorology and long-term planning, then they would come together and make a plan. Is that how Curiosity operates or is it different? Yeah, pretty much uh, Curiosity team is using the MER model, the Mars Exploration Rover Spirit and Opportunity model for operating uh, vehicles on Mars. So there's different science theme groups, there's a geology theme group, there's a composition mineralogy theme group, there's an atmospheric science uh, oriented theme group. And so it's basically what you just said, each of these groups, I mean, we were physically together during the first 90 SOLs of the mission at JPL. Now we've kind of scattered to the the Martian winds, and uh, 
we're all at our home institutions, although some many people are still at JPL, um, and we interact through teleconferences, video conferences, iChat technology, you know, all kinds of ways to stay to stay in touch and to come up with a with a consensus plan. So there's a lot of similarities to the way the Spirit and Opportunity were run. There's also some some important differences. Um, Spirit and Opportunity were uh, basically run by a benevolent emperor named Steve Squires. Uh, he is the principal investigator, the single point of contact to NASA for having responsibility for the success of the science as well as directing uh, the science team. Uh, and, uh, and so it, it would all kind of funnel through Steve in terms of the science team's interactions with the, uh, the rest of the uh, project management team, engineering team, et cetera. Uh, Steve had a deputy, has a deputy, Ray Arvidsson, and so they would split their time on opposite sides of the planet. And then below that level, there are six of us who are responsible for each of the, the main uh, payload instruments, so I was responsible for the, the pan cams, the colored cameras, and then a broader team of, of a few hundred people. On Curiosity, it's a little bit of a different kind of uh, uh, political structure. It's more like Cassini, actually, like Cassini on Mars. There's something called the Project Science Group, which each of the instrument PIs, there's 10 of them, are on this kind of uh, council, and that is overseen by uh, John Grossinger, who's the project scientist. And the responsibility is kind of vested in this group as a whole, and then that group has, uh, you know, their sub-teams that help to run the instrument and make sure things are going uh, properly and the instruments are safe and healthy, as well as do the scientific analysis. So it's a little, it's a little more distributed in terms of the, uh, the, the, the authorities and the, the various points of contact and all that. So it's, it's taken some getting used to uh, for me, um, but uh, and, and a lot of the rest of the team. And also the team is much larger. There's like 400 scientists, uh, and including students and collaborators and postdocs and, uh, that are involved in this. So it's a much larger team of people. So some of the physical spaces have had to be larger. There's overflow spaces in other buildings that we've had to use. Uh, so, uh, uh, and that's, that's, that's a difference as well. It's, uh, is, is it because the, of the vast size of the team that, that this mission has um, gotten off to what seems to be a rather slow start? I mean, I knew that it was going to be a slow start. It's a complicated mission, has a lot of things to check out. You all are proceeding with all necessary caution, I'm sure. But it does seem to be kind of slow. <laughs> so I would, not, I would say it's not the vast size of the team. I would say it's the vast complexity of the vehicle. Uh, Curiosity is a very, very complicated spacecraft. It happens to drive around on another planet instead of fly above another planet. Uh, but in terms of the, the scientific instruments, uh, the, the details of the power systems, the communication systems, all that, these, this is really an upgrade from spirit and opportunity. Uh, this is the luxury model with all the bells and whistles uh, and more capability for uh, detailed geochemical and, and mineral measurements, the, the SAM, the Kenman instruments inside the rover body. Those capabilities didn't exist, don't exist on, on Spirit and Opportunity. Uh, and uh, with 10 different payload uh, pieces trying to compete for downlink and time and power and you know, tender love and care when something goes a little bit awry, uh, it's just a really complicated system to put together. Add to that the arm and, and all of its capabilities that it's as an engineering instrument. The turret on the end of the arm, which has the, uh, the Mali hand lens camera, the APXS, the drill, uh, other instruments out there and sensors out there. That turret is the size of the Sojourner rover on Mars Pathfinder. So, you know, you're talking about a rover-sized thing that's getting waved around and very delicately placed onto samples. Uh, and so, so checking that out, checking the rover systems out, checking all the instruments out, all of this just takes time, and, uh, and and we knew, like you, all of us knew it's going to be a slow start, and it, it's a little frustrating sometimes uh, because so many things have to be ground in the loop decisions. But I think that we have to remember that the primary mission of of Curiosity goes till December 2014. So by the time we get there, this initial three four month period will seem like, I hope, a small fraction of the uh, of the, of the mission, and a, a fraction of time well spent in that initial characterization, calibration, checkout systems.
And in, in the meantime, the views, of course, are absolutely spectacular. So this is a Sol 141 view, so it's about a week old. And we're just looking out from the position in this area called Glenelg that Curiosity is right now. And it's, it's just stunning. The pictures that we're getting with these cameras, they, it feels so real, like you're standing right there. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what we're seeing as we look around from the position of the rover right now. Yeah, so this is, uh, it's really cool to be here because, you know, when we, when we landed and, and figured out where we were, and the team figured out where we were in the high-rise images and other data sets, uh, we, we could see that, you know, fortuitously, we happened to be very close to a, an important geologic contact, a confluence of three different kinds of terrains. And so uh, we, we knew we'd be able to do a relatively short drive and get a lot of information about where we landed. Uh, and so we kind of put a, a dot on a map and said, we want to go there. Uh, this would be back in, you know, the second week of August or something like that. And now, you know, darn it, we're on the dot. It's awesome. Uh, we finally got there. And uh, the cool thing about this place is there are these three different geologic types of, of rocks coming together. We can study all of them by being in this one place. And also we're in the low point of the crater floor, the topographic low point. So if there was water there, and we certainly think there was, you know, the press release about the, the stream bed deposits uh, certainly indicates there was a lot of water there. Uh, this low point would have been the last place that it was hanging out where it was draining away or evaporating away, what have you. would have been the deepest place where the water was, uh, was ponded or laked or whatever. Uh, and so it has a lot of potential to help us with this question of habitability. Um, and so, so, so that's where we are. Um, and uh, now we're looking for a place to drill into this stuff and to not only test out the drill, uh, but to see what the uh, chemistry and mineralogy tell us about ancient environments. So, so if you're here and looking at, at rocks that are made of sediments that were laid down in rather still watery environment a long time ago, why do you need to drive to the mountain anyway? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, the, the mountain is our target. The mountain is the goal of this mission because uh, we know that a huge chunk of Mars history is preserved there. Okay? So it'd be like uh, you know, driving around in northern Arizona there's all kinds of wonderful geology and cinder cones and lava tubes and sand dunes and great places to visit and learn something about geology. Just imagine going up there, driving around and saying, oh, we know the Grand Canyon's over there, but yeah, let's not go to the Grand Canyon. You, know, you, you can't do that. You've got to go to the Grand Canyon, right? It's like the superstar geologic spot on planet Earth. Well, for where we are in Gale Crater, the mountain is the superstar geologic spot. You can see these beautiful layers. You, you see them in the in the images from a distance. Uh, those layers are recording uh, different periods of geologic history of Mars, starting with the ancient stuff on the bottom. And from orbit, we can tell that there are exposures of, of minerals like clays and sulfur-bearing minerals that, that tell us about the ancient environment, what the conditions were like, what the atmosphere was like, what the pH of the water was like, things like that. We can see that from orbit, so we know exactly where to go. Uh, with our rover. We're going to start at the bottom of that stack of sediments, figure out the story, and kind of work our way up. Uh, we don't have to go incredibly high up to see a big chunk of, of ancient Martian history. Uh, but who knows? When we get there, we may want to keep climbing all the way to the top. You know, it's just going to be a matter of what we see when we get there. So, yeah, the stuff that we're seeing right now, it's interesting. It's, uh, if that was the only thing around, you know, we've gone to the, probably the sweet spot close to the landing, su landing site to, to learn about where we are. But there's just this amazing, amazing place uh, a few kilometers away. So we have to go there. That's our goal. Um, I'd like to show you an image that uh, I've gotten several questions about um, and see what you have to say about it. This is a picture from the MALI, which is the Mars Hand Lens Imager, taken on Sol 132. I don't remember quite which outcrop it was, but it was in Glenelg. And there are these um, rather, it, it looks to me like a, a poorly sorted sandstone, although I don't know of the grain size. But you see different little rounded grains inside the matrix here, including this rather light colored one over mm -hmm. here that of mm -hmm. course I've gotten lots of emails from people in Russia telling me it's a seashell and that therefore mm. you've discovered life on Mars. So yeah, I, I, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll knock that one down right now. But what yeah. do you see as a geologist when you look at this rock? 
Well, you know, I, you know, obviously I, I hesitate to make any firm interpretations because this kind of scale geology is not my particular specialty. But, you know, there are a number of working hypotheses for what's going on in places like this and other areas that we've seen. Uh, you mentioned one of them. This could be a sandstone that has, uh, you know, for some reason, it's not well sorted. Um, this could be an impact-related deposit. You know, impact craters are violent events that spew all kinds of ejected material and mix things together of different particle sizes. That's possible. This could be an example, another example of the kinds of stream bed conglomerate rocks that we saw on the drive to Glen Elk. Um, basically cemented sandstones that have been transported by, by water. Um, you know, the, the thing about that the funky little bright thing is that we don't have any chemical information on it, and we don't have any better data on it. Now, there's all kinds of light and translucent kinds of minerals, quartz, and different kinds of carbonates or, or sulfates or what have you. But um, quartz would be so pretty cool, right? That would be cool. I mean, it it would be uh, probably not, not too surprising okay. uh, because quartz has been identified from orbital observations in other parts of the planet uh, and, and most, uh, even, even the most volcanic terrains on Earth often have some quartz component to them. Uh, we know that there are veins in, in many of these rocks, so there, has been, there have been minerals transported probably through underground water into cracks and fractures in this area. So um, so I, I guess I wouldn't be so surprised, especially if there's only you know, tiny bits of it, which is very consistent with data that we've had before. So I don't know what that is. Uh, I don't think anybody on the team knows what that is. Uh, but the way you do this, when you're faced with, you know, that's, that's what you see, is you throw out some hypotheses and you say, what can we do to test it? Can we can we find, you know, fire the laser at it and get some compositional information? Can we get the molly closer and get higher resolution? Uh, can we find five more like this and convince ourselves that it isn't, you know, a fleck of tape that came off the rover or something like that? You know, uh, so uh, just lots of different hypotheses you throw at these problems. So I'd actually like to move to the other side of Mars, but before I do that, I just want to pause for a station identification and remind everybody that this is the Planetary Society's Weekly Hangout. We're an uh, international nonprofit space interest organization advocating for and educating about space research and exploration. You can find us online at planetary.org, where you can also join um, and become a member of our August organization, which has been around for more than 30 years, originally founded by Carl Sagan, uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce Murray and Lou Friedman, and now headed by Bill Nye, the science guy, who has taken this cue, I think, to show up in our hangout. Hi, Bill. Oh, you're, you're muted, Bill. <laughs> well, are you there, Bill? Microphone. Oh, there we go. There you there go. go. There you go. Hey, Hi, hey, Bill. Thanks for the thanks default for mute. Heavens, these kids today. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. We are hanging out uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the Mars experts. Dr. Bell and I, as you may know, go way back. Uh, Emily and I go way back. Casey and I are starting to go way back. <laughs> and uh, I uh, have been a member of the Planetary Society since the disco era, since 1980. And I've stayed in touch with everybody. And then through, I guess, Jim, Dr. Bell, I ended up on the board of directors. And now I'm the CEO. Oh, Life is kooky. So <laughs> what we do at the planetary site is promote planetary exploration. I'm sure the people that are hanging out here are getting an earful. It is a fantastic thing. I remind everybody, if we were to discover evidence of life on Mars, the Russian people with their seashells, it would change the world. It would change the world. It would change the way everybody thinks about everything. And so the cost of this is extraordinarily low. And what we are doing, especially with the help of uh, Casey, we at the planetary side are really advocating to keep planetary science in the budget uh, of the, of the um, U.S. so that <clears throat> we can make these astonishing discoveries and, and move, uh, move humankind forward in the next steps to explore space. Can I just put in my favorite uh, budgetary comparison bill that you bring that up? which is uh, planetary science. We spend less on planetary science every year than Americans spend on toys for their dogs. 
It's one of my favorites. So it's not a very large amount of money. Significantly less than Americans spend on donuts. Uh, it's a uh, 1.5 billion a year. It's uh, a rounding error, basically, for most of uh, the federal government. So please continue. I just love to, to throw those out. Well, thank you. Uh, if it's still my turn to talk, <laughs> just to everybody, uh, comparisons are good. Uh, and you know, it's a cup of coffee per taxpayer every ten years or some extraordinary thing. But just the stakes are so high. Nobody else in the world can do what Jim Bell does. Nobody else in the world and his colleagues, nobody else in the world can land a spacecraft on Mars and look for signs of water and life. I mean, this is an extraordinary business. No matter where you are in the world right now, uh, what Dr. Bell and Emily are involved in is just, and can't see, it's just amazing. It's amazing stuff. It brings out the best in us. It is the most worthy use of our intellect and treasure, and I, frankly, I am honored to be a part of it. <laughs> well, thank you, Bill. Um, and uh, take it, uh, as we say. Take it. Well, I'd like to invite people to ask questions, and you can do that by commenting on the YouTube uh, uh, video. You can do it by commenting it in Google Plus, or you can do it by using Twitter, using the hashtag Planetary Live. Um, I wanted to ask Jim a little bit about what's going on on the other side of Mars from Curiosity with our mm -hmm. old friend Opportunity, who will be almost nine, who's three weeks away from her ninth anniversary on Mars. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what are we looking at over there? Yeah, so, you know, as you know, Opportunity has arrived last year, year before last, at uh, the rim of this really big impact crater, 22 kilometer diameter impact crater called Endeavor. Uh, and it's a, it's an old crater, and uh, some of the rim sticks up from the surrounding plains, and so these are older materials. In fact, they're the, probably the oldest rocks that uh, we we have yet explored in detail uh, on rock on Mars. So we we came off of those flat plains and drove up onto part of the rim, and we were excited about this because in these old rocks from orbit, some of the orbiters see these these beautiful mineral signatures, again, like clay minerals, things that have water in them, things that form in water, rocks and minerals that form in water, rocks and minerals that form in neutral, not acidic water, so different than the kinds of rocks and minerals that Opportunity showed us uh, when we first landed and driving across the plains. So when you get a chance to do something new and exciting to see a new and exciting place, you take it, right? And so that's what we're doing. We've been doing a survey of this part of the, the crater rim, and we see lots of smashed up, fractured rocks because this was a giant impact, and it raised up this, this rim of, of mountains of material that just got lifted out of the ground, all jumbled up and mangled up, and so a lot of these rocks look a lot like impact rocks that we see on the Earth and probably on the Moon and other places. And kind of mixed in with these, we see the cracks and fractures, and there are these mineral deposits, like gypsum deposits that are kind of, you know, peeking out from some of these cracks and, and veins. Uh, and, uh, and that's a, an interesting hydrated mineral. It tells us that water was flowing through the ground in, this, in these ancient rocks. Um, we're looking for habitable environments with opportunity, just like we are with, with Curiosity. Different set of tools, somewhat uh, less capability, but a very experienced team and a very, uh, still very robust and, and highly uh, operational rover. And so we've been spending the last few months doing a little transect, a little uh, walkabout, some of the team members have been calling it, uh, driving around in this part of the rim looking for the most interesting contacts of the geology, right? Geologists are all about layers and contacts. So this rock is red, this rock is black, oh, look, that's the contact right there. That's the exciting place to go and, and, and study. And so um, uh, we've been finding those and we're doing things like measuring the chemistry across those contacts. Uh, looking at the geology and the, the, the microscopic level and the panoramic level, what's going on. And we're trying to find, one thing we're trying to do is find the surface expression of these clay minerals that we see from orbit. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that that opportunity is where it is is because one of the orbiters back in 2001 uh, found uh, hematite, iron oxide, Fe203, uh, uh, signals, uh, mineral signatures in the area where we landed. And so we sent the rover there. We didn't know what the surface expression would be like. And it turned out to be these little blueberries, right? The little round 
spherical grains of, uh, of rock that, uh, that are all over the place. And so um, by, uh, uh, by learning that, we could figure out, okay, these are probably water formed and they're related to these ancient watery environments. And we don't know the answer for the clays. What, is, what do they look like on the ground? Uh, and, uh, and so that's what we're trying to figure out in, in detail with opportunity. So it's, it's, it's slow going. It's very paced and measured. A little bit of uh, movement every day, kind of looking around. We just finished this uh, series of big panoramas. Um, and so you'll, you'll be seeing a, a new panorama show up on the PanCam website pretty soon once we finish uh, getting its 95% downlink. So we need just a little bit more. Uh, and then we'll get it out there on the web for everybody to enjoy. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to try to uh, get into some real detailed, you know, let's look at the chemistry of this particular material. Or remember when we passed by that rock, we thought that was the best example of that kind of texture. Let's go back there and study that in great detail. So, um, and once we finish working with this part of the rim, there's a whole 360 degrees or, you know, of rim kind of materials around. We'll drive to the next big outcrop of that, uh, to probably to the southwest, where we see even stronger mineral signatures from orbit. So, I was it's actually, a long-term plan. I was actually wondering about that, trying to figure out what's going to happen in 2013. Is, uh, does the team feel like Opportunity is going to be spending many, many more months um, on Cape York, or do you feel like it's going to be time to pack up and move on within a couple of months and get to some other part of the rim? My guess is the latter. My guess is that, I mean, it depends on what we see when we start looking in detail at some more of the Cape York chemistry, but my guess is we probably will start getting antsy for, to go down to the southeast to the next uh, segment of the rim. Uh, maybe a natural kind of break point would be the upcoming conjunction in April where you know, we're going to be essentially out of contact with the rovers for 10 days to two weeks while Mars goes very close to uh, behind the sun. Uh, that might be a natural break point to look to, to to think about, okay, wrapping up this campaign and moving on to the next one. But you know how this goes. It's all tactical. It's uh, what what did we just find? What did we just see? How do we need to follow up on, on what's there? And I got to say that the rocks right in front of you are just really awesome. They're so different from anything that Opportunity has been looking at before with these strange kind of pasty looking coatings on the on these fracture surfaces. It's just It's just weird. What are the... What are the current hypotheses for what we're looking at right now? Yeah, that one right there shows this beautiful contact. Oh, scroll back up again. Okay. You can see the, the beautiful contact in the uh, upper right piece between the, the dark lower part and the bright upper part. That's actually what we've been studying. That's where the rover is right now, a uh, place called Copper Cliff. And um, uh, so, you know, one hypothesis is that these are um, impact-formed rocks, so-called breaches, that have been altered and modified by groundwater. Uh, there's a hypothesis that some of these coatings may be the clay bearing material. We don't have enough uh, detailed chemical information to know that yet. Uh, so again, just like just like I was talking about with Curiosity, you know, the, the team sees pictures and other data sets, and you start to throw out ideas. And you know, as long as they're testable with the equipment that we have on board, you can call it a hypothesis. Uh, and a, again, it's frustratingly slow because you know. It takes a day to put the arm out, to bump up to the outcrop, put the APXS down, make a detailed chemical measurement. Uh, but we've all gotten used to that pace. Uh, so unfortunately, no quick answers for you. You know, we, we just started looking at that particular place in detail. Uh, we'll be getting chemistry data back and all that. And, uh, you know, a number of us are preparing to submit abstracts to the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, which comes up in March. And so I would expect there to be a lot of information about opportunities, current exploits on, on Cape York in that area you just showed uh, be presented uh, publicly the first time in March. Yeah, so the, and I should probably explain that the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference is one of several large meetings of planetary scientists that happen every year. It's the one that's a meeting of geologists um, who all get together in Houston every year to talk about geology and all kinds of different worlds in the solar system. And of course, Martian geology has been one of the more exciting areas of study for the last nine years. 
Um, and so I'll more certainly be more than well, yes, of course. But uh, since we had these rovers there, it's it's been uh, I think interest has picked up just a little bit. Um, I'll certainly be there reporting live for the blog. Um, I think Casey, we're almost ready to take questions. I had one that I wanted to go ahead and send to Jim. It was asked by Mike Howard, who's a good friend of mine because he developed some amazing software to help us browse the Mars Exploration Rover images. His question is, uh, um, are are you having a good time? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's really hard to uh, it's really hard to capture how much of a good time we're all having. Um, I, uh, I I honestly don't remember what my job was like before coming in every day and looking at pictures from Mars and you know working on rover operations. It's just like just what I've always done. You know, I mean, it's just crazy. Um, but uh, yeah, having having two vehicles operating again makes it uh, a challenge to keep up with everything. Plus all the other stuff going, teaching classes and dealing with students and uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, but I mean, this is why we're in the business. This is why you you know you start out as a student and you get a PhD and you work hard to write proposals and get on mission teams and spend hours in dark laboratories underground calibrating cameras. You know. This is why you do all that suffering uh, to do these missions, and uh, and so you know, those of us who have gone through this many times, including times where missions fail, and everybody's got a failure story for every one of their success stories, uh, uh, really know that we should relish this. This is this is good times right now for for Mars science, for planetary science in general. So much going on across the solar system, as you know better than anybody else. Yeah, it is a very good time, and I do hope that we keep it going. Um, it's a it's a tough fight right now. So, Casey, it is. Uh, <laughs> it is. I just let me just chime in and add mm -hmm. to what what Casey and Bill were saying. And I know that there's probably many members who are on the hangout right now, and and we, you know the society reaches out to members and says, look, write to your congressman, write to the president, take this to Washington, and you've done that. And and just so you know, on behalf of the whole board and the organization, thank you all for for helping to do that, for helping to make the case that, that planetary science matters, that space exploration matters. Uh, I, I think we should pat ourselves on the back. I mean, many of the cuts were restored, at least partially, in the, in the, uh, the budget that came out of the House and Senate that still hasn't passed. But uh, the, 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 the intention of many of our friends in Congress is to restore many of those cuts. And so uh, you know, we saw the announcement of a new Mars rover approved for 2020. That's good news. We need to get a mission to Europa. Lots of members are excited about Europa. So keep up the, the great advocacy work that you do, that Casey does, Bill does, Emily that you do, uh, and that members do to, to help uh, make the case for planetary science. Can I just throw in, uh, Jim, you talked about the pace of exploring Mars, that you're used to it, but if you had a person there, uh, I've heard twice, I've heard the estimates about 10,000 times as fast. Is that true? I don't know. It, it depends on how you, you know, what you want to be doing. Um, so, for example, I typically... I want to find microbes, Well, man. So, so, <laughs> so typically... Fossil you, pond scum. Let me finish. Let me answer. So typically what you do, Bill, is you, you go out to the field, you collect, or you, you send your graduate students out to the field, they collect samples, and then they bring them back to the laboratory, which you've got, you know, university laboratory or government lab, and you make lots of detailed measurements. It's very rare that we do something like what we're doing on, on Mars and bring the laboratory to Mars. Okay? So it's really apples and oranges. We're not looking at the same kind of thing. Because, you know, I mean, he, look, our friend Steve Squires has said, oh, I could do in a week what the rover's done in a year. Yeah, he probably could walk around and do all the visual stuff. But the, the chemical analysis, that has to get sent back to the lab. The detailed mineralogy, that has to get back, done back in the lab. That's going to adding weeks of time and effort. So I'm not sure about the 10,000 part, uh, but it certainly is true that if you had the ability to bring samples back and do uh, that detailed analysis, you could get more out of it. People were there selecting those samples or drilling in place or setting up a laboratory there. It, it would be scientifically... A big step up now, as you know, a lot more risk, a lot more cost, and a lot more time to do that. Well, let's take a question. 
Uh, yeah, I'm going to start uh, asking questions from users uh, just because we have so many, and I apologize in advance for all the ones we're not going to be able to read. Um, we'll try to address as many as we can after the fact as well. Um, but the, these are just really great, so I'm just going to have to pick and choose some of the best. So, uh, Jim, I have one from, I guess, LGRS22, and I like this one because they essentially ask, what have you found on Mars that you just have no comparison for on Earth? <laughs> you know, because you, you use lots of Earth geology kind of as... Uh, a way to understand what's happening on Mars, but what can you see that you just have no explanation for, or just is totally unique to that planet? I think uh, so. That's a great question. Uh, you know, the, the chemistry and the minerals seem to be very similar. The periodic table is the periodic table, whether it's on Earth or Mars or the Andromeda Galaxy, it doesn't matter. So it's not like we're finding new elements or any of that kind of stuff. For me, I think the most interesting and bizarre thing is how. Uh, how much the wind and the dust in that wind or the sand being carried by that wind can change things over vast expanses of geologic time. You know, we don't have anywhere on the Earth where we've had, you know, smoke-sized particles blowing over rocks for three billion years, right? It's just nowhere like that. It rains, there's glaciers, there's plate tectonics, you know, the volcanoes. Uh, but on Mars, there are places like that. So we're tiny, tiny forces that we would ignore uh, on Earth in terms of our very active planetary geology and, and atmosphere. Tiny, tiny forces that can act over long periods of time can really change the landscape. And that's something that, uh, for me, as a, a planetary geologist, it's, it's, I really have to kind of wrap my head around. This is a very different pace and style of, of changing the landscape on this planet compared to the one that I, that I live on. Well, one of the things that's always striking me whenever I look at especially surface geology of other worlds is the more we learn about other worlds, the more we realize how important life has been to the evolution of our own planet. The entire chemistry of the planet, every physical process that happens on this planet has something to do with life. So um, it, it makes it difficult to understand what geology does in the absence of life. And that's one of the reasons why we have to go to these other worlds is to try to simplify the system and understand how it works without life and then what it does with all of these other kinds of inputs, life and weather and, and time. All right, I'm going to keep moving on here. Alexis Vanderpool from Google Plus, I believe. Jim, what's your, you mentioned failure. What's your worst failure story? <laughs> oh, I was what, involved. What really hurt the most? Yeah, I was involved in a, in a mission called Contour, Comet Nucleus Tour, which, uh, you know, we spent uh, years uh, proposing this mission, got the proposal accepted as part of the discovery program. Uh, the PI was uh, my colleague Joe Viverka at Cornell, and Joe asked me to be in charge of the near IR spectrometer. And so I uh, worked with, uh, with colleagues at, uh, at APL to uh, build and test and calibrate the spectrometer. Lots of those hours in dark, murky laboratory basements, you know, calibrating spectrometers, talk about, you know, esoteric, lonely work. Uh, getting it getting it going, figuring out how to use this thing to study comets and look at different kinds of ices and minerals on comets. We were going to fly by three of them. Uh, great. Get the thing to the launch pad. Awesome. We launched it safely. Woohoo! That's the hardest part of the mission, launching it into Earth orbit. And then when they went to fire the main engine to leave Earth orbit, the spacecraft blew up. And uh, that was... Uh, oh, that sucked. Uh, <laughs> And I, and I distinctly remember a, a photo taken from the surface of Earth showing a couple of pieces moving in parallel across the star field, and you knew that the spacecraft had fragmented. Right, right. So there was a, I guess there was some kind of, there was an investigation, there was an official report on what happened. It was some mechanical thing. Um, but, uh, you know, from the perspective of those of us on the science team, we'd worked, you know, the better part of a decade to get this mission off the ground and to get everything, the instruments ready, the operations team, everything. And then it was just in an instant, it was gone. And, you know, within a week, the funding goes away, you know, and you've got nothing to show for it, and no papers, no scientific results, and students who were planning to make a big chunk of their career of business. So um, there are down downsides for every upside, absolutely. And other people have experiences with other missions that have gone awry as well. 
So um, we actually have several questions coming in about the kind of the difference between Earth and Mars photography. Um, and they're, they're ones that we get asked a lot about the brightness of Mars. Is Mars dimmer or brighter than it is on Earth? Are the colors the same or different? And why don't the pictures, especially the ones taken by Curiosity, why don't they look more different to Earth photos? Those Curiosity pictures, it really feels like you could have taken some of them just out in the American Southwest or the Chinese Yardangs or some of those other places here on our own planet. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Mars is, is uh, one and a half times the distance from the sun that the Earth is, and so uh, sunlight is is dimmer there. It's some 40, 30 to 40 percent dimmer. Um, we probably wouldn't notice that too much when we go because our pupils will just open up wider, and let more light in. And with our cameras, you don't notice it because we just take longer exposure photographs. Uh, so it's uh, you know, we don't intentionally take pictures that are dark. We try to boost up the signal and make them good, high quality pictures. Um, in terms of the colors, yeah, I mean there there are uh, so many kinds of red. I'm convinced that when when um, when people eventually live on Mars, there'll be 50 different words for red, just like the Eskimos have 50 words for snow, right? There's this kind of red, there's that kind of red. There's, you know, everything's a subtly different shade of red in the atmosphere. The air is reddish pink, uh, different times of day, different amounts of dust in the atmosphere. Those colors change. Um, the Curiosity cameras are very much like uh, a camera in your cell phone or in your own digital camera, that they have these little red, green, blue filters on them and they're designed to give a human interpretable comparable to our own eyes color. The, the pan cams on, on Spirit and Opportunity have filter wheels and so we put a red, a green, a blue filter in there and we would have to mix them on the ground in, in, a, in a Photoshop or some other homegrown software. Uh, but Curiosity, those cameras do that for us and so uh, you know the, the PI Mike Malin really wanted a true color picture of Mars without having to use filters on filter wheel. And, uh, and so that's, that's what we're getting. And, uh, you know, I'm probably one of the most delighted people on the planet that the pictures didn't come out green or blue. That <laughs> orange really is red. We're not screwing this up. Uh, and, uh, and the clarity of these pictures is, is, uh, is beautiful. You know, one of the cameras, one of the color cameras has three times better resolution. It's a telephoto lens compared to the pan cams on Spirit Opportunities, which is beautiful clarity. But a lot of it, that clarity depends on how much dust is in the atmosphere. Some days are more dusty than others, and you get hazy kind of view. Other days, spectacularly clear, you can see for tens of kilometers into the distance. Um, so uh, someone asks about the history of Mars. You talk about being able to look at the history of Mars. This is Kevin Weatherwalks. Uh, looking at the history of Mars from the rocks and the mountain, and he wants to know if there's active tectonic or volcanic activity on Mars, or if we're just talking about ancient history here, and if ancient, how ancient? Yes, great questions, Kevin. Um, so the, the real answer to whether there's active tectonics or volcanism on Mars is we don't know. Um, you know, there are different hypotheses about whether the Martian interior may still be hot or partially molten. There may still be some geologic activity down there. Um, the Viking landers carried seismometers, but they did not work properly, so we don't have any information about Mars quakes or anything like that. Um, there will be a mission launched in 2016 called InSight that will carry a very sensitive spectrometer that may help to answer that question about, about tectonics. Uh, we haven't seen anything you know, shifting like, uh, like faulting moving in the 30 years or so of spacecraft's observations. We haven't seen any volcanoes erupting. You know, the most activity we've seen is sand, little sand dunes moving or, or streaks of, of sand or dust or maybe even water coming down from some crater slopes. Very gentle, mild activity. Uh, so we don't have smoking gun evidence, that's kind of a pun, of, uh, of uh, active volcanoes, but we just don't know. We just don't know. I mean, some of the freshest looking uh, lava flows on Mars may only be a few million years old, and that's relatively young to, uh, to geologists. It may mean that there's still activity in some places. Uh, but one of the goals of continuing to monitor Mars and get down under the surface with seismometers and things like that is to figure, figure that out exactly. And then just the, the second part about how old. We think that the, the lower layers of the, of the mountain are 
uh, you know, date back to the earliest history, earliest period in Mars history, 3.2, 3.5, 3.8 billion years ago. Uh, it's hard to put absolute age dates on these because we don't have the samples in hand like we do with the Apollo samples from the moon that we can do radioactive age dating and get their ages very accurately. Uh, but we think that the base, the oldest layers, go back to the very earliest history when the conditions were more warm and more wet and there was liquid water stable on the surface. So that's where we'll be starting and then we'll be going up there which is kind of to younger and younger materials and if we go all the way to the top it's dust settling out of the atmosphere today. So you know you've really got the whole stack that samples uh, most of geologic history of Mars. Whether there are big pieces missing we don't know. If you do that in the Grand Canyon you start you know way back in the in the uh, Precambrian time or way, way back, and there are big chunks of Earth history missing in the layers in the canyon, unconformities are called. Maybe that's the same in the mountain. We'll find out. Here's, a, here's kind of a fun question that uh, clearly um, rovers are fun, right? What other planets would you like to send rovers to? Or <sighs> planets or moons. Moons, I, I call them all the same thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. sure. Oh, so look, I mean, we have, uh, there's many, many potential destinations for, for rovers. Uh, our own moon uh, is still uh, rich with mysteries about its past and what it can tell us about the Earth-Moon system. And there's lots of ideas for sending rovers to the moon. We could basically teleoperate them from Earth or from lunar orbit in almost real time like the, the Russians did with the Lunokhod vehicles back in the 70s. Lots of potential there. Uh, I've heard ideas about sending landers and rovers to Venus, even very sh you know, short-lived, very robust vehicles. Um, there's an enormous amount of, of information we don't know about our so-called sister planet. Uh, Mercury being the same category as the Moon, maybe getting uh, mobility up around those polar ice and volatile deposits, and sampling some you know ancient cometary materials from the outer solar system. We could do that on our own Moon as well. Um, Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto. I mean, Emily, these are planets. Let's just stop it, okay? These are plant. Ganymede is bigger than Mercury. Why aren't we calling it a planet? Let's just get on with it, okay? I'm totally <laughs> with you. I don't support any definition of a planet that doesn't include Titan in it. <laughs> exactly. It's a, a Titan so another, everybody, another I like the I like the expression the traditional planets. <laughs> there you go. There no, you there's go. eight traditional planets. There eight traditional go. planets. And the uh, dinosaurs are still alive, so you use the term ancient dinosaurs. Mm, birds are dinosaurs. Ancient dinosaurs, birds. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll take Traditional that up. Traditional planets, planets. Knock I'll yourselves out. I'll take that up with the committee. We'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, Titan's a great example, too. And, in fact, there was a proposal that got very far but was not selected to, to send a boat to God, basically that was bob cool. around in the in the, ethane, that. That was the cool. ethane seas of Titan, right? I mean, that's kind of roving in a very different kind of way, right? Uh, so uh, there's all kinds of destinations to land and, and rove on in our solar system. No shortage. And who knows when we're going to get to them? Um, we're who we're just a to discover. That's the big thing. <laughs> what are you guys going to find there? We don't know. That's why you go. You got it. You got it. So um, we're, we're just about out of time. I thought I'd throw one last question to you, which is, um, you, you know, looking ahead, looking ahead maybe about a decade or so, what would you like to see? What, what, what's the shape of American planetary exploration that you'd like to see coming in the next decade? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. And in fact, uh, a bunch of us just uh, participated in a, in a survey of our community to, to answer that question, to try to rank all those all those destinations I talked about, all the all the science that could be done, not just rovers, but with telescopes and laboratories, with meteorite samples, orbiters, flybys. I mean, there's so many uh, things to do and places to go that we, the community got together and, and organized through a study organized by the National Academy of Sciences and presented this uh, sort of survey of the community to uh, to the academy and to Congress. And I would like to see exactly what the survey calls for, a balanced mixture of big missions like Curiosity, like Cassini, like a, uh, a Mars sample return mission, a Europa uh, orbiter lander kind of mission, big things that, that maybe you do once a decade or so, as well as medium class missions uh, like the, uh, the Juno mission that's on its way to, uh, to Jupiter or the 
the mission that's uh, the New Horizons mission that's going to go to Pluto in a couple of years, just a couple of years now. And then small class missions like the you know the Contra one I talked about, but many other examples, the Grail missions that just finished their job at the moon, uh, lots of other uh, small spacecraft uh, insights, another example that's going to Mars, as well as you know support across the boards for uh, students, postdocs, young people. We have to you know, re replace ourselves as we're getting older and retiring and all that, uh, keeping a really robust program going on of, of going to new destinations, running new experiments in the laboratory or in the computer, pushing the limits of the technology, whether it's on the ground or out in space, to answer these big questions about the solar system. I think that's the track we've been on. And a lot of us think that this one and a half billion dollars a year is the magic number to stay on that track, to do all those things that that the community thinks is the most important science, the most exciting science and exciting return on investment to the taxpayers and students and teachers. Uh, and so that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see us stay on that track. Well, for me, I want to make sure we get a Mars sample return. You guys have been talking about Mars sample return since the 1970s. <laughs> and, so and it's always to, 20 years away. Yeah, that's right. I just want to make sure we get that done. So the 2020 rover can be part of that. And you guys, you're, the word we love now is caching, keeping things in the cache. If this rover is sophisticated enough to p get a sample and hold it in a grabbable way for the mission after that and the mission after that, uh, then I think we can get somewhere. Because everybody, if you're hanging out and you are, well, I'm a mechanical engineer. I mean, I'm human, but I'm a mechanical engineer. But when you talk to the planetary geologists, they think, I mean, I'm not exaggerating too much that if you, have, if you had a rock from Michigan, you could tell who was president in 18-something. And then, furthermore, if you look at the rock really carefully, you can tell who's going to be president. In other <laughs> words, they feel that there is so much information in a sample. This is what you were talking about earlier about bringing it back to the laboratory at the university or government lab where you really look at it with exotic or exquisite instruments. And look carefully. So I just I want to emphasize to taxpayers and voters and planetary memory supporters, we want to make sure that the doggone sample return gets gets finished. We want to finish that important uh, job at Mars. And that's the next important job at Mars. But uh, we don't also don't want to neglect the entire rest of the solar system. Well, There's yeah, a lot of other worlds out there to explore. Sure. All right. Well, it's been great, you guys. Uh, happy 2013. Uh, keep us posted with. We're going to get new Pan Am, uh, Pan Cam images, 95% complete. We're, we've almost got a, a big panorama down. I, I assume that there's a whole bunch of amateurs out there that have made beautiful versions with the 95% that's down. But uh, okay. so we're, 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 we're going to get to the 100%. Don't worry. <laughs> and in the next few weeks, Casey especially is going to be fighting the good fight in Washington, D.C., to make sure that this, this funding stays or maybe gets increased so that we can, we can continue to use our intellect and treasure to discover more about our place in space. And I'll be Thanks. spending the next couple of weeks telling you all about uh, what's going on in 2013. There are four launches coming up this year. There's one to the moon named Laddie. There are two to Mars named Maven, and it's the Chinese. I mean, sorry, the Indian Mars Orbiter Mission or MOM. And India's finally, going to Mars. <laughs> India's going to Mars. And finally, there's the Chinese Chang'e 3 mission, which is going to be the first lunar soft lander since 1976 that will actually deploy a rover that looks an awful lot like Spirit and Opportunity out onto the lunar surface to start driving around and doing on the moon what we've been doing on Mars for the last nine years. So it's, it's going to be a really exciting year. Please check us out at planetary.org. Please join, support the Planetary Society. Um, I want to thank uh, Bill Nye, I want to thank Jim Bell, and I want to thank Casey Dreyer for showing up today to hang out with us and talk about space. Please tune in next week, same bat time, same bat channel, for the Planetary Society's Hangout. Until then, I've been Emily Lakdawalla for the Planetary Society blog. Thanks for listening. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, members.